And welcome to our discussion today on the right to vote. I'm Ellen Alderman, the chair of the Maine Suffrage Centennial Collaborative. Our co-hosts today are the Maine Historical Society, uh, the League of Women Voters, the ACLU, and the Girl Scouts of Maine. And on behalf of all of them, I want to thank our terrific panelists for participating and all of you for joining us. Today, August 26th, is Women's Equality Day because it was on this day 100 years ago that the 19th Amendment declaring that women had a right to vote finally became part of the U.S. Constitution. And here in Maine, our slogan for the suffrage centennial is hard won, not done. And that's our theme for today too. Hard won because actually there was nothing inevitable about us, about women, gaining the right to vote. When the nation was founded, only 6% of the population could vote. You had to be a white male who owned a certain amount of property. So the suffragists had to fight fiercely against men and women for generations to get the right to vote. And not done, because even with that momentous victory in 1920, so many people were still disenfranchised. Native Americans, Chinese Americans, for example, had to fight for decades more. And still others, especially Black Americans, only had the right to vote in name and not in reality. And of course, today we still see all kinds of efforts to discourage and disenfranchise voters. So you add to that a global pandemic and hard won, never done, seems appropriate, and it is. The founders warned us that the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. But take heart, the suffragists showed us that anything is possible, and we've got a terrific panel here to help us stay vigilant around the right to vote. And I want to introduce our terrific moderator, on a day when we are honoring pioneers, she is one in her own right. She was the first female Chief Justice of the Maine Supreme Court, and now the Dean of the University of Maine Law School. So I'm honored to introduce Dean Lee Softly. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Lee Softly. My pronouns are she and hers, and I am truly honored to be moderating this incredible panel on women's suffrage and voting rights. Let me talk to you a little bit about how this afternoon will work. I'm going to invite each of the panelists to speak briefly to introduce themselves and tell us why, why are they here? Why does this interest them? Then we're going to hear some of the history of the battle to obtain and enforce those voting rights, both in the original effort to enact the amendment and in the years that followed, particularly for women of color and Native American women. Then we will have a conversation about current challenges and the ideas and work necessary today to break down the barriers and assure the vote for all women. For those of you who are listening, you're welcome to present your questions in the question and answer segment right at the bottom of your screen we will try to work them in through the afternoon. And I'm going to now turn to the uh, introductions. I'm going to do this in alphabetical order. And Allison, that means you begin. Thank you so much, uh, Dean, Chief, Lee. I'm not sure if I can get used to calling you by your new names. It's a pleasure to be back with you. Uh, Lee works. Okay, Lee, and uh, so delighted to see you in your new leadership role. Um, my name is Allison B.A., pronouns she, her, hers. I'm with the ACLU of Maine, and I'm delighted to be here today to talk about one of our most fundamental rights as American citizens. Um, and it's critical that we all stay engaged and happy to talk about the history, but also really interested in what we can do in this present moment to make sure that these rights are, are fully enforced for all people here in this country. Thank you, Allison. Molly, you're up next. Thank you so much and thank you for having me. My name is Molly and Dana. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am the tribal ambassador for the Penobscot Nation and I am very happy to be here today 
to talk about um, why voting rights are so important to my people. I believe we were the last people in the country um, to be granted voting rights. And I have sitting here with me my daughter, Carmela Bear, who's 13. And I have a long history of bringing my kids to work. So I guess this is what this looks like right now. <laughs> um, and I, when I think about this battle, I feel that I am squarely in the middle of what used to be and what is going to be. So it's important to, for me to focus on that future. And that's with my daughter joining me today. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Molly. And, and welcome to your daughter. We love to see the new generations joining us. Anne, you're up. All right, so my name's Ann Gass, and I'm the author of Voting Down the Rose, Florence Brooks White House, and Maine's Fight for Woman Suffrage, which was a book about my great-grandmother, who was a, a suffrage leader in Maine 100 years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, researching, it took me 15 years to research and write this book as, as a, you know, as I was doing other stuff, but it turned me into a, a very committed and passionate women's rights history activist. And so I spend a fair amount of time uh, talking about this these days and I'm just really delighted to be here today. Thank you, Anne. Anna. Hi, I'm Anna Keller. My pronouns are they, them. I'm the executive director of the League of Women Voters of Maine. And I spend um, every day thinking about voting rights and how we can make more it easier for everyone to be able to participate in our democracy and have their voices really count. The League came out of the suffrage movement. It was founded by many of the suffrage leaders after the passage of the 19th Amendment. And so as a hundred year old organization this year, we've been reflecting on our own history along with the history of the suffrage movement. The, battles that were won, the mistakes that were made, and the work that we have left to do today. And as um, not only in my professional role, but as a non-binary American in Mainer, I think a lot about what does gender equality and gender justice look like within um, our society and our politics today. Thank you, Anna. Crystal. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. It's truly a pleasure to be here. My name is Crystal Williams. I am an attorney at Bernstein Shore. I practice in a mix of corporate uh, and energy law. Um, and I'm also pretty active in the community serving on several amazing nonprofit boards, including the ACLU of Maine. And I really came to the issue of voter rights over the past two years as I began to follow Stacey Abrams work and as states have increasingly been passing more restrictive legislation that really disproportionately impact racial minority groups. I think we all saw in the 2016 election what happens when people don't come out to vote. And uh, there's a real opportunity, particularly as we face this election cycle, to really engage in various communities, both communities of color and communities um, that are depressed economically. Those happen to be two communities that I grew up in um, around voting rights issues and really encouraging members of those communities to come out and vote in their interests. Thank you, Crystal. And uh, at this point, we're going to move back in history. And so I'm gonna ask Anne to talk really about the, the struggle that got us to the 19th Amendment. Anne? All right, so if you're like me, uh, you may have read a, a statement like this in your high school history books. Women were given the vote, they were given their vote in 1920. Um, and maybe it was accompanied by a photograph of white women wearing white dresses marching down this wide city street. And I just wanted to start there because those words, those seven words, both miss and misrepresent so much about this history. Let's start with this basic fact, which is that women were never given anything. They had to fight for the right to vote and for pretty much every other right we won along the way. Um, also in 1920, there, there were millions of women who could already vote. 26 states already had full or partial suffrage in, in uh, 1920, one through state action. So the 19th Amendment really enfranchised about 22 states, or at least fully enfranchised them. A lot of them were in the South. However, not all women were enfranchised by the 19th Amendment, as has already been said. 
And I thought it would be helpful to take a look at the actual language of the 19th Amendment. It was crafted very narrowly, and it reads, the right of the citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. It was modeled after the 15th Amendment, which had been ratified in 1870 following the Civil War. And, and that the 15th Amendment was almost identical in language, but instead of sex, you would swap in race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Because the 14th Amendment had inserted the word male into the Constitution for the first time, the 15th Amendment really only enfranchised black men. And it took 50 more years of struggle to add sex into the, the Constitution in connection with voting rights. But let's also notice the focus on citizens, the word citizens, because the US didn't recognize Native Americans as citizens until 1924. And Molly and, and some of the other panelists will talk more about that this hour. And lastly, just talk about on account of sex. Um, suffrage activists were simply seeking the removal of sex as a barrier to voting. And I, I just wonder about that because in retrospect, by 1920, they must have known that this would happen, that it, would, it, it was kind of an overt ex acceptance of poll taxes, literary, literacy tests, and other ways to limit voter participation. And it meant that black women and men in many parts of America had to wait until the Voting Rights Act of 1965 to, to become closer to fully enfranchised. So I asked myself sometimes, well, why did they focus so narrowly on the vote? Why didn't they just go for maybe the ERA or some other progressive civil rights legislation that would have benefited uh, you know, a, a broader spectrum of the population? And I think it's because the the, just to win voting rights the way they did required enormous struggle. Women had to overcome centuries of misogyny embedded in our laws, our, our religions, and our social customs. If you date it from the 1848 Seneca Falls Conference, it was 72 years. That's three generations of women working on just the right to vote. Um, and if you date it more properly, as I think you should, from the time the Constitution was originally ratified back in 1788, that's 132 years uh, where women are not recognized, uh, you know, as voters, as citizens in the Constitution. So it took a huge amount of effort. And though I think they knew at the time that it wasn't enough, they'd need more work, they hoped that voting rights would become this kind of pry bar that they could use to make other social change happen. And finally, the, another huge challenge was that America was even more racist then. And that's relevant because remember to pass a constitutional amendment, you have to first get it through two thirds, uh, get a two thirds vote in both houses of Congress. And then you have to get three quarters of the states to ratify. And of course, you know, the Jim Crow laws were very active in the South. They knew that they would need at, le at least a couple of Southern states very likely to ratify in order to get it through. And so that was part of the reason why they, they put a face on the suffrage movement of being white women. Um, and it really wasn't just a Southern issue. I think we, we in the North like to blame the South, but in Maine in 1915, at least, there was at least one Congressman who basically made it very clear that he would not be voting for the 19th Amendment because he didn't want to burden, uh, those were, that was his language, the South with um, adding black women to the, to the voting role. So here's a Northern state um, not, not going along with the 19th Amendment. And I, I think about it today, and to, you know, as we think about today, you know, trying to maneuver some progressive piece of legislation through the existing House and Senate and how difficult that would be. I mean, there are always these hard choices to, to make. Do you compromise to get something done faster or do you uh, wait out and, and see maybe the next election will bring you a different group of faces there and votes uh, or, or maybe you can do more education to change some minds. So I'm, I'm gonna stop there. I think that's a pretty quick um, summary of, of how we got to the 19th Amendment, but I, I hope you appreciate what, what a huge um, effort that was. It wasn't perfect. They recognized it at the time and uh, we still have a lot of work to do and that's what the rest of the panel will talk about. Thank you, Anne. And I'm sure we will come back regularly to the challenges that occurred just getting to the 19th Amendment. And that takes us to Crystal. Crystal, talk to us about uh, what happened with 
women of color at around the time that the 19th Amendment was put into place and what has happened since that time? Yeah, well, I think Anne laid it out so beautifully. And I'd like to actually go back in time because leading up to even the ratification of the 15th Amendment, I think there was like there was a real tension between suffragists and abolitionists to establish whether it was more important to be black or to be male or to be white. And I think that we can see through the progression of the ratification of the 15th Amendment and then the 19th Amendment following so much later, the way the power structure at the time really voted. Um, but as Anne also mentioned, the states had a tremendous amount of power in terms of implementing these um, the constitutional amendments and how they played out in in reality and the Jim Crow laws, which were an evolution of the black codes, which were really intended to legislate and restrict black movement and black participation in the political system, really hindered first the black male and then the black female's right to, to vote. So we had things like poll taxes, literacy, literacy tests, um, these were all things, and, and when those didn't work, when people still tried to show out to the polls, there was just outright violence. You had lynchings, you had abuse, there was intense intimidation. So even though the constitutional amendments on the face appeared to give both Blacks and male, or Black men and women, the right to vote through the 15th and 19th Amendment, in reality, that, that right was not honored. Um, and, and to this day, we still see effects of that and the amount of uh, Black people who participate in, in voting. And I think also, you know, from my perspective and as I became involved in this work, what was really fascinating and quite frankly horrifying for me was to see Stacey Abrams' gubernatorial run um, and how that played out in terms of the really questionable voter tactics that uh, likely had a, um, an impact in the way that vote, uh, that, that race uh, turned out. So there's still quite a lot of work to do, um, not only in making sure these communities that Black women are enfranchised and included, because we've always been there doing the work both in supporting the rights of black men and also supporting the rights of women generally. So black women have always been at the table. We've always been boots on the ground, but when it comes time to actually enact laws, um, as Anne mentioned, compromises are made that inevitably leave black women out. And as we have seen and increasingly see, black women are a very powerful, voting block. And when Black women are enfranchised and included and understand the power that they have through their vote, powerful things happen. And so, you know, for me, I, I feel very much like I'm on a personal journey to not only learn my history, but hopefully to use what I learn and the law skills that I have to change the future. So I'm very hopeful as we move forward, even though there's a lot of work still to be done, it's very encouraging to have such a diverse multicultural group like we have on today's panel to talk through these issues and to link arms again to say, you know what, no more compromises. We want equality for all. So <laughs> I can get on my soapbox for a while, but I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> Do not stop, Crystal. <laughs> the very important soapbox. Uh, I'm going to move now to Molly and, and, uh, and ask you to give us some context for Native American women and the vote. Sure. So um, the previous panelists have laid this out very well, that Native American women were also kind of a forgotten group, um, probably indigenous people overall. You know, citizenship had been extended through the Snyder Act in 1924, um, but states ratified citizenship and voting rights for indigenous populations um, on their own. And I think Maine was the second to last to do so. And that was in 1950, 1963, 1963. that's why I brought her. <laughs> Horrible with numbers. 
Um, so thinking about that, you know, both of my grandparents, both of my grandmothers are uh, Penobscot tribal members and they were both born in the late thirties. So I think about how much of their lives they spent disenfranchised and, and not a part of the state and the country. I also think about how indigenous people serve per capita uh, the most of any group in armed services in every war of this country, even before they were citizens. Um, so I think about, you know, what what all this kind of meant for, for different tribal nations across the country. And the so we have this layer of we are sovereign nations. We are supposed to have this government to government relationship. However, we are also in these treaties where we are being, um, you know, paid back for the complete attempted genocide of our people and the theft of our land and resources. Um, those things are never solved. It, it's never brought made whole. It's never brought to equality. Uh, those treaties always need to be going. So when you talk about voting and, you know, civic engagement way back in time and now, there's a reluctance of a lot of tribal people to take part in a system that has tried to exterminate them um, and that isn't living up to the promises and that isn't making good on these treaties. So you know, in, in a pandemic right now, this is very, uh, for lack of a better word, triggering for a lot of tribal nations where our ancestors were completely decimated by diseases on purpose. So we're, we're all grappling with a lot, I think. And when I think about my grandmothers showing up to work, raising families, um, being active members in their community, uh, later being political leaders and serving as tribal clerk and tribal councilwoman, I, you know, I have to think about what is that magic in them that makes them want to participate in these systems that have held them down for so long. So I think where we're at right now, probably a lot of us in this country, we're asking ourselves those very same questions. Um, you know, a lot of us feel oppressed and not great about a lot of things going on, but we recognize that we have this small bit of power in our vote. So do we all band together and, and force this issue? And that's what I'm trying to impress upon a lot of tribal people that kind of throw their hands up and say, nothing ever changes, nothing gets better. We're always going to be chasing our tail. Um, you know, it's been a struggle to communicate. Yes, this is our history. You know, it's, it's hard to want to, you know, vote for people whose ancestors really harmed your ancestors. And but we're all in this cycle right now together. So let's work our way into these systems and try to make things better. Thank you, Molly. And I'm going to follow up with a question from the audience. Uh, would you speak to the question of the limits on tribal representation in the state legislature even today? Yeah, of course. So um, the tribes through um, some kind of, for Penobscot, I'll speak for Penobscot Nation, every tribe has a different kind of story to tell. But Penobscot Nation, we traditionally had um, family chiefs that came down in a hereditary manner. Back in the 1800s, there was a shift. It was called the old party and the new party. It was people that wanted to embrace democracy in the tribe and have elections. And it was people that wanted the hereditary chiefs. Um, so in kind of the state of Maine stepped in and um, helped is a tricky word, but they were there. <laughs> and out of this compromise came this representative position to the legislature. So we had had that position for a very long time. Other tribes have established the same position in different ways. And for Penobscot Nation, um, we, so the, the position hasn't ever had a vote. They, the rep could sit on committees, they sat in the chamber. Um, I don't believe they voted in committees either. I might be wrong about that. Um, they could introduce legislation, but they could never vote. And the thought was that we're supposed to be maintaining our sovereignty, even with the 1980s Land Claim Settlement Act, even with all this going on, uh, to maintain our sovereign nation status, we didn't want to vote like another municipality. We also, the way the districting is drawn, we are represented by the same rep that um, has Old Town, and, and we're in the Senate district of, of that. 
So we are, so we would be doubly represented if we had a vote. Now in 2015, we pulled our representative from the legislature and I realize this is not my whole hour, <laughs> so this is probably a lot to go into. Um, and long story short, the, the relationship didn't feel equal with a representative. The ambassador position was created. Uh, I currently am appointed to that position. So my role is, is being in the state house and filling that void on a more uh, sovereign nation level. Thank you, Molly, and that's helpful. And did you want to respond to that as well? No, I think she did a beautiful job. I don't really have a lot to add. Okay, thank you. So, uh, so let's move then uh, to this question. Um, I think, I hope I get this right. Uh, I think it was Alice Paul who said in 1920, the fight has just begun. We're a hundred years after she said that, and it feels like we're still fighting. So Allison, uh, what's happening now? Why are there so many challenges? Well, thank you. Um, big question. Uh, we could talk about that all day. I think I want to honor what uh, some of our panelists have been talking about, though, and, and reflect on the fact that we are being sponsored by Maine Historical Society, because I think it's really important what Crystal said. Specifically, we need to know our history. And I think many of us, particularly many white people, have never learned their history. And I think the issues around, it's not just what happened in 1920, it's what happened in 1965, it's what happened in 1976, it's what happened in 2016. And so as white people, there are, uh, there are issues that we have not addressed or made amends for, and that we need to continue to be doing this work, or we will continue to uh, divide instead of link arms, as has been mentioned, to make sure that all groups are are protected in this democracy, which is the aspiration, uh, maybe not the implementation of our constitution, but the aspiration. So I wanna uh, thank Man Historical for, for bringing us both the history and into the present moment where, we, where this fight continues. So to your question, Lee, what is happening right now? There is, uh, you cannot turn on the news, uh, you cannot be on any social media without knowing that, that the issue of voting rights is front and center. I, I believe that there's sort of two, two buckets of work that we're struggling with. We have structural challenges right now to the right to vote. Um, and then we also have sort of almost psychological or moral challenges to the issue to vote. And they're really connected and they're interrelated and we're going to have to solve both if we want to ensure that our democracy uh, is fully in envisioned as we had hoped it would be. So the structural ones are, are relatively straightforward but not easy to fix. Uh, we could talk about them all day. So just a, you know, a couple of highlights. We can think about um, voter ID laws. We thankfully don't have voter ID laws here in Maine, uh, but all across the country, there are ways that people are restricted access to the ballot um, that really harken back to old historical ways of trying to keep certain groups of people from voting. Um, and those groups, to, let's name those. These are to keep black people, to keep brown people, to keep communities of color, to keep indigenous people to keep poor people, disabled people, um, you know, from actually exercising their right to vote. So we have those issues. We have lots of problems with absentee ballot. Here in Maine, we have pretty, uh, pretty good absentee ballot laws, although there's more to work on that Anna's gonna talk about for sure. Um, but uh, many places make it very hard to vote by absentee. So in a pandemic, when many people cannot leave the home, the states are making it very difficult to be able to vote absentee. Um, Polling places, uh, you know, I have this long list of things. I'm like, which one should we cover today? Uh, polling places, when, we, when we, we've seen that when polling places are consolidated, it has a direct and immediate impact of uh, sort of disenfranchising certain people from voting. Um, and I, you know, a topic that's very important to the ACLU is the issue of felon disenfranchisement. So as Crystal was referring to, you know, Jim Crow was reincarnated in our mass incarceration system. And so in most states in the country, if you have a felony conviction, you cannot vote um, either for a period of time or forever. And so that has a way of disenfranchising enormously large groups of black and brown uh, people all across the country. So we have all of these barriers to keeping people to vote. And in this election, we're seeing conversations on the national level about um, the, you know, the uh, 
trying to keep make it safe to vote. And that kind of leads to the second, I call it psychological concern, is we have, uh, there seems to be a, pro a challenge in this country of people saying, you know, my vote just doesn't matter, right? It just doesn't count. I just, why am I participating in this? And, and not to necessarily to Malian's very important and I think legitimate concern of tribal members saying, why would I want to participate in this? But I'm talking about people who have just lost faith who have been able to vote, but aren't exercising it. And, and that is, I probably don't need to tell people on a conference call from the Maine Historical Society that the right to vote is very important, but I think it bears remembering for all of us that this is a right that people died for. Right? They literally put their lives on the line to vote, or they gave their entire careers or their, or their free time to making sure this vote. So, so when anyone you know, says that, that uh, voting doesn't matter. There are de generations of people who would, would disagree other, would, would disagree with that. And I think it's because we understand that voting isn't just an individual right, it's a collective right. It is how we come together as a group and make change in our democracy. And so we have to work together to, to protect that right. I also think we wanna you know, talk to people in our daily lives about if voting didn't matter, people wouldn't be trying so hard to keep people from voting. I mean, this is really, you know, if it really wasn't going to make a difference, we wouldn't be seeing battles about you can't, you have to have, you know, you have to have a you know, medical you know, reason for not being able to vote. It's just outrageous in a pandemic. Um, you know, there, you wouldn't be seeing the, the increasing um, uh, restrictions on, on where you can vote and what polling places. So people know that this is a way to stop people from exercising their power. So I think it's these two, both the structural and the psychological work together. And I think it's our job, all of us, to in everything we do and how we talk to people, both to combat, you know, work with organizations like the League of Women Voters or the ACLU or with Malian and, and to, to make sure that at the State House and in, with our Secretary of State that we are, we are advocating for that. But there's also a really important role for all of us every day to really be talking to every single person about why it votes. And I love that, that I know that the suffrage uh, centennial group has been working on getting high school kids to vote. And I just think that that's so important to make sure that they understand from day one um, uh, that it's really important. So I, I know Lee, I'm supposed to go to the terrible, but I go with Crystal that I'm going for hopeful that, that you know, there may be challenges, but we're going for it. Going for it. I, uh, I absolutely love that. We are going for it because we do not want to let that the psychological, uh, it's, there's, it's just too much, I, I can't vote, get to all of us. So your point is incredibly well taken. Uh, what has amazed me in the last three or four months is how little we all know about the fight for uh, racial justice, the fight for the vote, there's so much of our history that we are not taught along the way. So I'm, uh, I'm really grateful. Crystal? Yeah, I just wanted to briefly mention to that point, um, the Congressional Research Service, which is a fabulous organization that puts out policy or research articles for uh, the sitting uh, Congress people. Earlier this year, they published about a 50 page document on African American African-American members in U.S. Congress from 1870 to 2020. And as I was reading through that document, you know, once again, I was reminded of the power of legislation that really restricts right, the state's ability to prohibit people from voting. And that really um, also limit the amount of intimidation, whether formal or informal, that um, various groups can use to, to disenfranchise uh, people of color. So I just want to provide some very quick statistics around uh, voting legislation just to show you the impact of it. So three years after the 15th Amendment granted Black men the right to vote, the 44th Congress, so this was around 19, oh, 1873, had eight Black congressmen, seven representatives and one senator. That was the highest number of Black serving in Congress until the, 19, uh, the 91st Congress in uh, 19, around 1969, which voted 11 Blacks into Congress. So the 1969 Congress was several years after the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So you really begin to see 
when people of color, when communities of color realize that the government is supporting their right to vote, it really begins to change the, to Allison's point, the, the psychological landscape and people's willingness to believe and show up because they believe that their vote matters. And so although those, those numbers thankfully have continued to increase over the years, but for black women, we are still, we are about 25% represented among the black population in congressional positions. And we are around 15% of female population. This is for the most recent congressional, these are the most recent congressional stats. So there is absolutely still work to do, but the numbers are trending in the right direction. We just have to make sure that the laws continue to support that effort. And that uh, takes us back to being hopeful. And that takes us to Anna. What, what can we do? What's being done right now? What can everybody listening to this panel be thinking about doing to support voting rights? There's so much um, going on right now that really, you know, no matter what kind of a, a person you are, what, where you live, what you like to do, there is a way to participate in um, the work um, that is happening at this moment. Um, I started in politics as an organizer and so um, you are going to get um, from me the, you don't just watch a panel discussion and learn about your history. You've got to come away from this with some action steps. Um, just very briefly before um, you get into that concrete piece, um, one thing that I did want to mention is that even before COVID, even before all of the things about the post office and the most recent news that we've been hearing, this election would have been an enormous struggle and it would have been about voting rights. Um, when we look at Maine, sometimes we can take it for granted that we have good laws. Um, we have high voter participation. We have one of the highest rates of voter participation in the country. It's usually us or Minnesota as the top one, two. Um, but if you scratch below that surface, even in Maine, you see huge disparities in each community. Um, in 2016, Falmouth voted, 86% um, of registered voters in Falmouth voted in that presidential election. You go to the middle of Lewiston and that house district, it was just over 40% of voters. It's not a coincidence that those are communities that have in one hand, the lowest and one of the highest um, rates of people living in poverty. So when we look at who's voting, who's facing barriers, um, logistical, legal, or psychological to voting, we have to really look at the local level and look at um, what's going on in each community. And at the same time, our election administration in Maine is incredibly local. Um, the decisions that get made, um, it's not just as it is with all election things that the decisions are made at the state level. Those decisions are implemented at each city clerk or town clerk's office, um, often by one overworked person trying their best, but who might not have had the latest training or definitely doesn't have enough resources and might not be having a good day. And that could mean someone doesn't get to vote. So, so Anna, when let, we me, think, let me leap in with a question on that very yeah. point. The local control over elections, has it in Maine resulted in a consolidation of polling places? Have we seen that actually happen here where fewer and fewer polling places are available? And if so, is there any place where that information uh, is being consolidated and is available to the public? There have been attempts at consolidation. Most of those attempts have been pushed back. Um, for example, Augusta last week um, was planning to go from four polling places down to one, but they had such an outcry from citizens in Augusta against that, that they couldn't find a second council member to second the motion for them to even vote on it. 
um, we've seen a similar thing happen in Portland, which in the primary wanted to go from its 11 polling places down to three, partly because of concern about a shortage of poll workers. The city put out that they needed poll workers and got three times the amount of people that they needed signing up overnight. So what we're seeing is that people are really willing to jump in and understand the importance of this. And so that, you know, this isn't just happening in a procedural decision. Um, and I understand why the, some of these clerks are pushing for consolidation because they're looking at some tiny polling places, some that won't work for social distancing. They're looking at some of their most experienced people not being able to come in. And they're thinking it would be a lot easier to have one big location. But sometimes that one big location is way out of town and hard for people to access and have a whole bunch of issues with it. So most main towns only have one polling place. There's only, I believe, 11 communities that have multiple polling places, and we've been watching them very closely. But if you hear of anything going on in your town, and this applies not just for polling places, but overall, if you have um, a question or a concern, um, or you hear something from your town clerk that doesn't seem right, um, you can talk to the ACLU, you can talk to the league. Um, and we also have a Facebook page, um, it's called Help Maine Vote, um, Help M-E, Me Vote. Um, and you can post a question there and we're using that as one way to find out about where there are issues. Um, and that kind of fits me right into the question of what people can do. So much of what we're looking at is local. It's making sure that um, there's enough poll workers, that we have people building relationships with our clerks to figure out where we're gonna face issues and try to resolve them. Um, we do voter education work. We've got a voter guide um, with a league. It's vote411.org, where you can see who's on your ballot all the way down to the local level. Um, and we're looking for volunteers to help um, to fill out those, um, all of that candidate information and make sure we've got all of that um, information in the nonpartisan voter guide, um, helping register people to vote. We've got work going on in high schools. We're looking um, for people of any age, but especially looking for high school students that are maybe already doing this work in their community to connect with us and connect with the network that we're building around the state. Um, and we're doing some door to door work, even in COVID, socially distanced, working with landlords in affordable housing um, buildings around the state to make sure that people who often are not reached by um, typical campaigns or the system are able to register to vote and get the information that they need and get that information in multiple languages. So like I said, many different kinds of work going on. And this is just work that the League is doing in our broader um, world of many, many organizations are taking um, on roles from tiny community led ones to the big, in, big national organizations that are doing work. And we're trying to keep everyone connected to each other, keep, you know, coordinated and creative at the same time. Um, because what you might know, um, what needs are arising in your community and how you can pull together the resources to face an issue there. And that's what we want to be able to support you with. So I will just say one um, yep, last no thing, um, because Allison and I um, are um, both part of a coalition that has been working on um, advocacy around um, some of the remaining things that need to be done for this November's election. We're hoping to see an executive order from the governor coming soon on some of those. Um, but that is just keep your eyes out for an executive order in the next week or so that should um, resolve some of the remaining issues. And we're hoping to see things like paid postage and drop boxes and other things that'll help us vote come into that as well. So you, you have uh, partially answered my next question, which is there's a, there is a great deal of inconsistency from town to town, because as we've said, this is, this is local. And uh, many of the towns are not making it easier. So there's no paid postage to get uh, the ballot back to the town. Uh, you're already hard at work on that. So that, that may answer that question. Can I ask you to restate the, how people who are interested in helping 
or providing information, they should get to uh, the League of Women Voters website or to what is, tell me what is Help Me Vote. So um, two resources, one is the League of Voters, League of Women Voters of Maine website, which is lwvme.org. Um, if you go there, you'll see the link to volunteer or learn about any of the ways to get involved and also all of our voter information, um, uh, educational programming, we're doing all of the rest of that. Um, and then if you have um, a question around voting or a concern that comes up or you're thinking, I just ran into this situation that I've never heard of before and what do I do? Um, you can go to the Facebook group, Help Maine Vote. Um, which um, the ME abbreviation, help me vote. And um, that is being monitored by the league, the ACLU, um, and a couple other uh, nonprofit organizations that have expertise in voting rights to make sure that we can be supporting voters. So uh, we've, we've just had a comment that is fascinating uh, from uh, one of the listeners saying that all ballots are delivered and the town is billed by the post office for the delivery if postage isn't already provided, which is helpful, but doesn't help the individual who doesn't know that and doesn't have the postage. So, um, so let, me, uh, let me go back to, um, and I, I, Allison, I'm gonna draw you back in here. What can we be doing to reinvigorate the Voting Rights Act? Where can people advocate for that to be brought back to life? That's a great point. And I think uh, given that it's, isn't it the first, law student's first day at, at Maine Law today? Oh, uh, so working on it. Maybe we should, you know, cite a case just to make it. So, so there was a very, as many of you all know, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was probably one of the most important pieces of a federal legislation which dramatically expanded and gave life to the to these amendments that we're talking about. Um, but in 2013, the Supreme Court in a case called Shelby County versus Holder, um, uh, well, I mean, the, the details are what, you know, would make Professor Czar at the law school very happy if he could, you know, identify the case and write it out. But essentially it was, it required, it got rid of a requirement for, for cities and towns and states that had been, had a history of disenfranchising votes. It, it got rid of their obligation to kind of get permission from the federal government before they added new restrictions. And so what we've seen since 2013 is just like a rapid unraveling of voting rights all across the country. Um, and that has really, it has really significantly changed the, the environment uh, uh, of how to, um, you know, how to protect. And any of this is a great quote in, in the dissent in that case where Justice Ginsburg, who, you know, the ACLU likes to take, you know, take great uh, like pride in as, you know, as she was part of the ACLU a part of her career. She wrote, I, I'm going to get the quote wrong, but she, she basically said getting rid of this requirement uh, which would, you know, to keep people from uh, putting more restrictive voting right laws was the equivalent of saying someone should um, get rid of their umbrella during a rainstorm just because they're not getting wet anymore. You know, I mean, it just doesn't make sense. And so there's been this unraveling. So what can we do about that? Um, is, you know, one of the things is we can do is continue to keep our state rights very, very strong. And so what Anna is talking about and what we're all talking about here in Maine is, um, is we see in the legislature every session an increased attempt to actually roll back those laws. So even though we have some of the strongest voting rights laws in the country, there, that is that is a fight that we have every year. Our you know the coalition that we work with, um, uh, the ACLU works with, we have our hands full every time. And so for each of you on this call, getting involved with whichever you know nonprofit you're interested in, and, and testifying or joining or talking to your legislators that we do not want to restrict the right to vote. So I always bring it down, maybe because uh, you know I'm so committed to the state. I always think about what can we do at the state level. Um, you know, but it's, it's that kind of activity of staying engaged and really um, continuing to talk to your legislators about this, this really, you know, matter, because, matters because our, our ability to change at the federal level individually is a little harder. Collectively, 
you know, uh, ACLU works on this on a national level, and I'll put in a little plug that the ACLU is going to actually have our deputy director of the Voting Rights Project at National ACLU um, is going to be doing a, a conversation with, with actually with Crystal and I uh, on September 17th about all of the voting rights efforts that are going on at the ACLU with its, with its allies across the country. So hearing from her will be fascinating to hear about other efforts we can take on the, on the federal stage. But here in Maine, there is certainly plenty of work for everyone to do every session and every day, should you find it in your heart to do that. Good plug, Allison. Nicely done. Thank you. Uh, so let me uh, let me toss a question out to any of you. Is there any benefit today to requesting a mail-in ballot versus uh, early October? Yes. Anna, yes. yes. <laughs> Vote as, so er you know, as early as possible. There's a graph going around of the um, absentee ballot curve and how we need to flatten the absentee ballot curve because if everyone requests their ballot three weeks before the election, clerks in the post office are going to have a really hard time handling um, all of those requests, all of those ballots, all of them coming back in. Um, if you request now, you can um, get ahead of that. The ballot will get mailed out in early October and then we'd encourage you to um, fill it out right away, um, put it right back in the mail or return it to your town office. And all towns are also doing in-person absentee voting where you can go into the office and vote your absentee ballot um, ahead of time. Some of them have, you have to call them up and find out when, but everyone is doing it. So that's another option for people as well. But do it early so that the people who really have to do it at the last minute aren't facing those barriers. The sooner the better. Okay. Lee, can I just jump in? I, I feel, um, although we are honoring many uh, historical women in the past, um, I think I realized when you asked me that question about what can we do at the federal level, I, I neglected to mention John Lewis and the passing of John Lewis and, um, and the importance, uh, the unbelievable contributions that, that he has made. And, and that is an option for people to make sure there is the John, the sort of attempt to restore the Voting Rights Act with the John Lewis, uh, well, I have to get it right, the Voting Rights Restoration Act, which would be to bring, uh, to undo the, the, the da damage of the Shelby County versus Holder case. And so that is something that you can call your representatives about and urge them to, to both honor his legacy and also to restore this incredibly important part of our democracy. Uh, thank you, Allison. I, it's uh, we could we could talk about that a lot. We have just a few minutes left. Let me uh, take you to a broad question that that we've received, which is, how might the ERA be a boost to the voting initiative and power of women all through the United States? Does anyone want to tackle that one? We're still fighting for an equal rights amendment. Crystal, you want to you want to feel that? No, I I'm going to punt it over to Anne. It looked like she had some things to say, and oh. I feel woefully underprepared for that question. Well, you know, I think it goes back to a, a little bit of what Molly Ann and Crystal both said about feeling as though you're um, not valued or or not um, encouraged to be part of our our you know politics in our country, and and I I do think that passing the ERA would give women a foothold um, that they don't now have, and, and, a, and especially in some key areas of uh, pregnancy discrimination in the workplace, and uh, also equal pay kinds of issues, and domestic violence. I mean, those are three areas where there, it's still, it's clear, it's very clear that women seeking remedy uh, for any of those issues are, are, you know, get told by the Supreme Court, uh, sorry, we can't find any basis for that, or, you know, for supporting that in the, in the Constitution, you know, you're kind of out of luck. And so I, I, I do think that uh, telling women that they're equal under the foundational document of our country uh, might do a lot to in, inspire them and, and, and encourage them to get engaged. Uh, thank you, Anne. Uh, Molly, and I'm going to put you on the spot because your daughter has been wonderful and patient to stay with us through all of this. And I think about 
the new generation. So here's the question. Uh, what kind of ideas do we have for motivating and inspiring young people or people who feel marginalized or those who are cynical about the voting rights actions of the past? What can we do to engage your daughter and her friends in all of this going forward? How can we do that? Well, if you all figure out a way to make her listen to me, I'll be forever <laughs> grateful. <laughs> um, no, I, I think, you know, raising daughters, uh, Carmela is my older daughter, she's 13. I have a younger daughter, Layla, who's 11. So I think about this a lot. And uh, I think what I, what I see that really sparks their interest is when things are unfair and kind of blatantly wrong in the country. And I think right now we're seeing a lot of protesting going on against a lot of these injustices. And the difference in this moment is that protest is being uh, sort of, you know, not supported, but not ignored. Uh, we're recognizing this moment right now with racial equality and, and all these sorts of things. And we're saying, okay, this isn't going to stop until we put policies in place, until we have discussions with lawmakers, until we go to these kind of top levels of things. And I'm seeing lawmakers and people in power uh, and people with a lot of money, they're listening to the protesters too. You know, when Colin Kaepernick first started his peaceful protest, taking a knee, he was like, the unwanted stepchild of the NFL. You know, he was essentially kind of blocked out from his employment for it. And now everybody's on this bandwagon. Uh, you know, I, I haven't heard them say they're sorry to him, but they should. And, uh, and, and, you know, an interesting layer to that is it was funny seeing the NFL really going after racism, but still having the Washington team. So I'm really happy that they saw the hypocrisy in that and made that important change too. So when I think about my kids and, and people their age, I really think when they start to see the process work for uh, everybody, or at least a lot more people than it has, that'll have a really substantial impact, I hope. When I was a teenager, I was able to um, go to the legislature and testify on some things you know, this is timely because I testified on the Offensive Names Act bill, which would take the word, um, you know, the S word, that's a racial slaw for indigenous women, uh, racial slur, sorry, <laughs> uh, for indigenous women off of that mountain in Maine. So I saw the process work. I saw all these indigenous women talking about their experiences with that word. I saw lawmakers listen and act out of humanity. I saw the law made, and now we're trying to change the private business. Um, so this is another little call to action, friends of Squaw Mountain, and I don't usually say that word, but I'll get the point across, um, drop them a little line and say that it's about time to change that word. So I, you know, that sparked something in me at a young age, I saw the process working. And I think with younger people, if they see all of us working and seeing results and not just kind of banging our head into a wall, uh, that might encourage them. Thank you, Molly. And I think, I think that uh, speaks volumes and it gets back to something that Allison said early on as we were talking. We have to stay positive. We have to believe that uh, we can affect change and we really have to keep talking to each other about those things that can be most effective in creating change. So given that uh, we're ending on the high note, I'm going to go right back to Anna for a wrap up. What one thing should we leave here thinking we should do to make sure that voting rights are protected and improved? One thing, huh? Um, request your absentee ballot now or have a plan and a backup plan for how you're gonna vote. Um, so do it for yourself. Do it for your family, do it for your friends, <laughs> tell them, um, pass the word. Um, and once we get past this election, um, don't give up there because all of these laws and all, and people are gonna, you know, it's not gonna be the hot topic anymore, but there are so many structural and deep changes that we need past this election. And we're all gonna be needing to work on them 
once we're out of the centennial year, it's still going to be 101 years, and that's going to be a year that we still won't be done. Part one, not done. Thank you all very much. This was an amazing panel. It's wonderful to see you all. To all of you listening, we are just about on time, which is very impressive with all the things to be talked about. Everybody stay positive and listen to Anna. They have told us what we have to do is vote. Do it. Good to see you all. Take care. Be healthy.